Movie making is an adventure. I mean, every different movie, or even whatever you're involved in in this business, is a different adventure. It just takes you to different places. You're going to Thailand, Bangkok. Yes, sir. And you never know where you're going to go. You never know what's going to happen. Nuclear wars have brought forth mutants of incredible size and strength. Only the Magnificent Eleven can save the people from terrible death and destruction. The Earth is about to be saved by Space Warriors 1999. Dick uh, did a deal with the head of the police in Thailand. And uh, they were doing, it was the, the massage girls in Bangkok, and that was very illegal there although it was all going on, but he actually wanted to make a movie about the massage girls in Bangkok on the back of another film he was making anyway. He'd done two films at the same time. So we were in this hotel in Bangkok, and I was there for about six weeks. And he said to me, you know, honey, he said, I think you might have to leave on somebody else's ticket because what has happened is the head of the police department in Bangkok has asked me for more money, and I told him he has to kill me for it. <laughs> Please, I don't like Leave me alone! <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean it. I didn't think I was... Think those girls are in trouble? Are you kidding? He's the one who's in trouble. But he did get home alive. <laughs> and he got his film out. signing a contract on a paper napkin, which I've still probably got somewhere, in the Champs-Élysées in Paris. That enabled the whole thing to start rolling. And Dick had, done, had an arrangement with um, various people in the Philippines. And I think he was shooting another movie at the same time. This must be the cave. What do you think, Tabati? Yes, yes. This is the place we fought the natives. We'll all be killed. That gold coat. Oh, my father said we'll all be killed. Why did we ever come into the sand jungle? I set an office up for him in Hammer House, and uh, that, that appealed to him actually because the, the guy who set up Hammer Films uh, used to sit in that same office. So we organised it for Dick and. Dick felt really at home there, and then he decided to, uh, to, to cut his connections in Rome, basically, and um, sort of set up in England. I think we moved in London about 1981. Yeah. Well, I wanted to get out of Italy. I just didn't, you know, we had too much. It was always difficult in Italy. They got us one day coming out of the bank, and. You know, they were going to shoot Dick because he had some money in his pocket because he didn't have somebody standing there with him, and it was just too dangerous living there. Dick Randall was still very much a man of mystery. He was an American working in London, and yet no one ever saw his films. They certainly didn't turn up at the local Odeon, that was for sure. I was worried the first time I met him because I was going to be in the presence of a kind of legend. And people I worked for in this country weren't in that bracket. My conduit uh, to him was Ray Self, who was a very influential man in my life. He got me into the business, he introduced me to Pete Walker. And uh, in 1984, Ray was working for Dick. He was editing two features, cheap slashers called Don't Open Till Christmas and April Fool's Day. Edmund Purdom had, had persuaded Dick that he should direct a movie. And Dick wanted to make a movie about Santa Claus's being killed or killing. And so Edmund Purdom was hired to act in this movie and also to direct it. Well, Edmund Purdom is a lovely man. He's an eccentric and he has a beautiful voice. A director he wasn't. 
and uh, there was a dog that appeared in the movie and he sort of spent more time explaining to the dog what he expected of the dog than he did to the actors. <laughs> I got really mad at him because he had quite a bit of money in the bank and I didn't want him to shoot any more films. And I said, look, Dick, if you do these, you're getting older, you shouldn't do these films, you know, because you've got all that money in the bank, you can sit back the rest of your life and you never have to worry. He did three films right after the other. <laughs> I, I seem to remember there was some movie being shot in his house one day when I went around there and there was sort of girls clambering in and out of his bath, which was great fun. <laughs> yeah, it's in his house. It was all shot in his house. This woman comes out of this computer that's jealous and she goes around the house killing everybody. You know, the computer itself. I mean, that's just... That's far out, isn't it? Howard Adams is a man with a strange obsession. For him, the difference between life and death is only a heartbeat away. I mean, he did a film on necrophilia. I don't know anybody that's ever done a film on necrophilia. I mean, do you know anybody that did a film on necrophilia? But Howard is in love. <laughs> and when a guy's in love, the thing he wants most is to be with his girl. Smile, twinkle, toes. Living Doll is obviously a, a very black comedy. When you think that people like your Buckerite in the, in the 90s sort of made, made careers out of making really grim necrophilia movies, I was surprised when I came across Living Doll because I suddenly realised that, um, that, you know, someone else had been there first. And what a fantastic movie to find Eartha Kitt appearing in. <laughs> Do you have a girl in there? No. I heard voices. He never gave up. He was doing deals, you know, the day he died. Every film to him was a new hope. It was a new dream. It was a new... He loved his work. When he died, as far as I know, there were no obits. I think Ray may have phoned me up and said, oh, Dick's died. There was nothing in the papers. It was as if he'd never been here. He'd been in the country for I don't know how long. 20 years? That's extraordinary to be here that long without ever seeing his name in the papers. How did he do that? What a remarkable man. In some ways, the films made today are a lot less interesting than the sorts of films that Dick Randall used to make. Uh, in a movie industry that is uh, run almost entirely by accountants, Filmmaking has become rather bloodless. It seems as though films are run by men in suits, you know, who certainly don't have the kind of exciting connections that Dick had, who, who, people who were able to set up films through nefarious means. I mean, that's what we miss, isn't it? You know, you look back in your career and you say, well, hey, come on, you can't take it all too seriously. And there were some wacky moments, and Dick provided a lot of them. I don't know anybody that did what Dick did. I don't know anybody that would, you know, sacrifice as much as he did to do what he wanted to do. I mean, he'd give up anything to do his dreams. And he was right. He lived his life the way a man should live his life, you know by his dreams. There's no other reason you should live unless you do the things you want to do. He was just a dirty little, you know, New York kid. And he was always a kid until the day he died.